Hi, thanks for tuning in today. You're about to see a worship service that I hope will be a blessing to you. If you would like to help support the ministries of the Visalia Methodist Church, you can click on the comment link below and that will take you to a, a giving tab. We hope that the worship service you're about to see and the sermon you're about to hear will be a blessing to you. God bless and thanks. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. There we go. All right, I've got a long list of announcements. It's not my particular skill set, so I'm going to go quickly. Please lend your ear. Pay attention. If you hear something you're excited about and I go too fast, it'll be on the screen in the narthex afterwards. Are you ready? Here we go. Welcome to the Methodist Church. Thank you for choosing to attend to worship with us. We hope you will enjoy your experience this morning. I would personally put and are challenged by it. If this is your first time visiting either online or in person, please help us to get to know you by texting the word VISIT to 559-657-6848 and be sure to fill out the digital connection card. If this is not your first time, then you should know what to do. Number two, today is Family Sunday, a time for families to worship and share communion together. We like to have the little ones with us, so um, we do have nursery for children four and under, if you would like to avail yourself of that. If not, we uh, would like for the kiddos to stay with us in worship and to receive communion with us. Tomorrow night, uh, Monday at 5.30 in the choir room, which is just off of that hallway, out that exit sign, we have our annual charge conference. The district superintendent will... Uh, be here to lead us through our end of the year, effectively end of the year business <clears throat> meeting. The fall fundraiser continues. Bids uh, will be accepted through next Sunday and winners will be contacted the following week. The missions committee today is selling tamales between services. If you uh, are not clogged up, you might be able to smell a little bit of tamale in the air. They are $2.50 each or $24 for a dozen. Gift of Love annual Christmas gift giving for children in need choose a child they're uh, listed in the lobby this morning and once i think once we get those families all filled we have another bunch of families that will list next week so uh, please give yourself the gift of giving for christmas upcoming events this friday is the christmas suite that is our uh, annual musical celebration of the christmas season and the birth of christ we like to challenge diabetes on that night by having a massive dessert table um, and, and we do, do need people to, to bring desserts, so call the church office or talk to Alejandra if you are willing to bring a dessert. This year, the, the world's most dangerous ukulele choir has almost doubled in size, so it will be what I think of as a cacophony of joyous sound. In addition, Reverend Creel Visalia and Reverend Creel Three Rivers will be singing with Alejandra. And, and really, uh, given that I'm going to be playing guitar, that's something you do not want to miss. It could go up in flames and be a great story for years and years. Okay, Service of Remembrance is next Sunday at 2 o'clock here in this uh, space. It's a really powerful uh, opportunity for people to take the time to mourn and to remember those that won't be with them this holiday season. If you would like to be a part of that, you, uh, please call the office and uh, let them know the name of the loved one that you are there to remember, and they'll have an ornament with a personalized name uh, on it. If you forget to do that, just show up, and, and we always have somebody out in the narthex that will take care of that for you. Supralo Women's Community Group invites you to mingle and jingle at the Lynch Gang Homestead Potato Bar Dinner on Sunday, December 11th at 4 p.m. For details and to RSVP, call Nancy Lynch. <clears throat> and the annual La Posada event will be held on Wednesday, December 14th. So that's not this coming Wednesday, but the Wednesday after that at 5.30 p.m. It's amazing and beautiful and a really nice mixing of our congregation. So we hope you will plan to attend one or more of the special holiday celebrations and invite someone to join you. I think that's the end of the announcements. <laughs> that's great. Again, I know I went fast, but we have... Uh, website, you can call the church, and we have the big TV screen out in the narthex so you can review I the, the details on any of those things. Let me see what I'm supposed to be doing now. Okay, great. Uh, I think that's right. Yep. Will you rise, please? So Kelly's out ill, and uh, humility is good for the soul, so it's great, great for me. The scripture comes from the Old Testament, Psalm 24. 
The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein, for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Will you bow your heads for a word of prayer, please? Father, we gather today in joy and thanksgiving for your grace and and for all that you continue to teach us through the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask that you would dwell in this place during this worship service, touch the hearts of those who are willing to be open to your bidding, and bless us as we look at Scripture and do the things that your children are called to do. It's in the beautiful name of Christ that we pray. Amen. All right, let's see what we have now. Now we have lighting of the second Advent candle. That's Sharon Rico. God kept his promise of a Savior who would be born in Bethlehem. Preparation means to get ready. Help us to be ready to welcome you, O O Lord God. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight, every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crook, crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough ways smooth, and all flesh shall, shall see the salvation of God. Luke 3, 4 through 6. Thanks, Sharon. Okay, we are prepared now to enter into our worship time. Take a deep breath. Let the past uh, week's cares go out with the breath when you blow it out. Open your heart to the bidding of the Spirit. Join us in celebrating God through song and in asking God to touch us and to reveal to us where he needs us to be or what he desires for and from us. of 
of his love and wonders of his love and wonders and wonders of his love we will sing 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 joy to the Please be seated. I was giving her some scene instructions. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> okay, so this morning we're going to. Uh, look at the scripture right away, and then in the sermon, more than usual, I, I will just break, it's a fairly long uh, pericope, um, and we'll break it up and talk about the different parts of it, but let's put Matthew 3, 1 through 12 up on the screen, you know, the kingdom preaches in the wilderness, I'll just read it from the screen to be easier. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not think that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham." The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand. And he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of Scripture this morning. That's a tough Scripture, isn't it? I have too many papers here. I was watching Antique Road Show about a month or so ago, and the poster guy, if you watch Antiques Roadshow, you know that there's a poster guy that wears really loud checked uh, suits, and um, he's, he's an interesting John the Baptist type of dresser. Uh, he, he was going to value a poster for somebody, and at the first shot, you could just see the strange uh, evaluation person and the poster, and the poster, I'll describe it for you, it was 
bright green, bright yellow, bright orange. Uh, there might have been some uh, uh, purple in there. And it had wavy, like paisley uh, kind, kinds of lines. And, and I knew right away that that, that has got to be a, a poster for uh, Woodstock or for another concert like Woodstock, right? And, and sure enough, it, it ended up being one of the posters that was put out for Woodstock, which, by the way, if you have one, um, we would like for you to sell it and give 10% to the church. Because it turns out if they're in good shape, they're, they're quite valuable. I knew just by looking at the design of the poster without being able to see the specific uh, Woodstock and, and the dates and the place, pretty much what it was going to point the way towards. In the same way, if, if you were to walk up and, and see at a distance a, a poster or a billboard that had pistols and ponies in the background, you would probably be able to guess that it was going to be a country concert or a themed event of some kind. The, the way the poster looks is meant to uh, help you be interested in the event that it is describing. And this morning, at our first glance, I want you to think of John the Baptist that way. Uh, in Scripture, there's almost no mention of what anybody wears or what they eat, except for Holy Communion, except for John the Baptist and, and a one-off. Jesus uh, talks uh, in the Gospels about the church officials who love to wear their, their long tasseled robes and sit at the place of honor. But other than that, they, you know, in a novel, they, they would say John was about five foot four. He was a skinny little devil because uh, locusts don't have a lot of meat on him. And it's weird for the New Testament to, to take the time, the writer to take the time to, to describe his dress. Scholars uh, like to weigh in on the Gospels were written for Jewish Christians, at least some of them were written for Jewish Christians, and the description of the dress and the food would have signaled them that... Uh, John was an Essene. Do you all know what an Essene is? Okay. So this is a, a bizarro equivalent, but it, it'll do the job pretty well. So conjure in, in your mind um, the, the uh, Quakers, right, in, in Pennsylvania, the, the, the old-fashioned people, they don't use electricity, uh, that kind of thing. And now conjure them with uh, guns really, really angry and threatening at any moment to uh, do something about what they're angry about. And, and you have a pretty good picture of the Essenes. The Essenes were a, a uh, group located outside of normal society, and they were rigid in their discipline. That's why the, the crazy diet and, and the way they dressed. And, and they believed that if they were good enough if they reached a level of perfection in their behavior, that that would trigger the coming of the Messiah. So it wasn't a, a group that you got to say, I'm sorry, in very often. If, if you messed up, you were out. It turns out in that time period, the Essenes ended up being the last ones standing. In 70 AD, uh, Rome wiped uh, tried to, to wipe Jerusalem and all of Israel off the face of the map, right? Uh, they, they destroyed everything they could get their hands on. And you've heard of Masada, the, the mountain where the, the last holdouts were. All of them were Essenes. Some of them were Christian Essenes, and some of them were Jewish Essenes. They, they kind of mixed. They didn't, they didn't care, right? But, but that is the kind of people that John came from. If you wanted him to be quiet, you were going to have to make him be quiet. And if you disagreed with him, you did so at, at a potentially very, very high cost. Got, Got a picture in your mind? Did I paint the, the poster well enough? He, he is the, right, if he, if he were in your family and he had wanted off to become an Essene, you would not invite him for Christmas dinner, but you'd send him a nice card. John, the Essene, is the poster for Jesus. Of all the people that God could have called, of all the situations that could have unfolded, uh, right, uh, uh, almost innumerable, God chose uh, a, a little dyed-in-the-wool the uh, anti-pretty-much-everything zealot sold out for the cause of the Christ coming, and John and the Essenes believed that when the Christ came, the first thing he would do was wholesale slaughter of everybody who wasn't a chosen person. So they were serious, serious people, uh, and, and most folks just steered a path around them. 
we see John as the poster child for what's coming. And it's hard for us because the rest of the gospel that follows does not seem to show the Jesus that John advertised. Right In the scripture that we read, you, you, you can almost feel the, the, the zeal and the joy in John's heart when he says his, his winnowing fork is in his hand and some of you are going to the fire. He's as happy about that as he ever was about anybody being good. And, and that's almost a form of seeming false witness because the Prince of Peace enters into the scene then, right? Born a baby in, in a manger and, and, and he comes and and uh, he not only deals with sinners, but he honors them with his presence, and he takes the time to hear them, and, and that's Romans, and that's Pharisees, and Sadducees, and Zealots. He doesn't seem to be anything like John the Baptist promised he was going to be, or that the very figure of John the Baptist promised that he was going to be. And because there is that difference, that dichotomy between the threat or the, the promise and the reality, a, a lot of people just let it go and we dismiss John except for he's the odd guy we talk about during the Christmas season when he comes up. I am going to imagine that you are with me a, as guilty as most Christians of doing that, right? You just, you just think, well, you know, he's, I know odd people too. He's just odd. But he, he did open the way for Jesus, Jay, so let's get on to the Prince of Peace and forgive me my sins because that's very important to me. I want to slow down today, though, and look more closely at whether or not we fool ourselves to believe that the Jesus who came on the heels of John the Baptist's predictions is all that different from John the Baptist's predictions. I don't really think, if you look at the New Testament and think about the basis of our faith clearly, that it holds water to say Jesus was not like John the Baptist said he would be, or that he didn't have the effect that John the Baptist said he would have. I, I think it's clearly true that John missed some of it. Jesus was not an angry tyrant coming to settle scores, but his presence divided creation, right? Theologians also tell us that when they're not talking about the Essenes. His presence, his passion, and his resurrection, they're a clear demarcation in history, and nothing has ever really been the same, not only for people of faith, you and I, but for the whole of the world with the coming of the Messiah. So I'm going to go back through the scripture a little bit at a time. Don't worry, this is a uh, short, medit relatively short meditation, not short at all. <laughs> it's four pages, but I might riff a little bit. I'm going to go back through the scripture and just talk uh, through that with some examples because I, I think it will help establish um, John the Baptist in a, a different light and maybe open us up to receive his message and, and that of Christ. So uh, again, John the Baptist starts out by saying, um, this is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. He's pointing to Jesus, right? A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. So John the Baptist was announcing a radical departure from the organized religion of Israel. And that part is absolutely true, right? It got Jesus in trouble. He, he was so radically different that they couldn't stand him after a while because he threatened the status quo. But it goes beyond just he didn't attend the right meetings or know the right people or say the things that all the rest of the religious people were saying. Jesus was offensive to the religious people because to that point, less than the Essenes, but still at a pretty high level, their religious view was this. If you disagree with us, even if you have power over us now, God is going to destroy you and your children and your grandchildren. Our God is so great that at some point he's going to make a bloodbath out of those who have harmed us or who even disagree with us. And it's obvious Jesus was not dialed into that channel, right? So we talk about he, he offended them by talking with sinners. He offended them by doing this. And, and underlying all of that is this. The offense of Jesus was he didn't seem to know the rules. And he didn't seem to know right from wrong. Let me clear that up for you. Those who ended up conspiring to put him on the cross noticed this about Jesus. 
He's in the wrong party, right? He's in the wrong, he, he doesn't belong to us. He doesn't say the things he's supposed to say, and he doesn't believe the things he's supposed to believe. That makes him our enemy, because you're either for us, because we have it all figured out 100%, and we're all right, or you're against us, and God hates you and will kill you. Jesus was absolutely not like that. Right? He, he seemed to be on a, a quest to go and gather as many of the enemies of the right party as he possibly could and bring them into to whatever it was that he was doing. It's hard for us to understand the offense that he gave by doing that. But the truth is, in his own beautiful and peaceful and, and kind of slow and methodical ways, Jesus destroyed the concept of we are the chosen, and therefore everything we have discerned or think must be right. He obliterated it simply by reaching beyond the chosen to those who were called sinners and dealing with them as if they were full human beings. So most Christians have heard many, many times that the people of Jesus' day expected him to be a warrior or at least to unleash an army of angels. And then they believed that when that happened, they would be set up to rule the world and they could lord it over and mistreat and be horrible to the people who had lorded it over them and mistreated them and been horrible to them. And they were profoundly disappointed to find out it was not true. Most of them, their disappointment took this road. They refused to believe that Jesus could be the Messiah. You remember they voted between Jesus and Barabbas. They'd rather have had Barabbas who was a murderer because he was more in line with their idea of God who kills the people they don't like because they're not right. Jesus really was not in line with the popular ideology of the day. So let's at least today, this morning, for the few minutes that will be in the sermon, hold out the idea that Somehow Jesus managed to be both the fierce person that John predicts and which the people wanted, but that there's a twist in the story because it turns out the fierceness is not required on Jesus' part. It's the very fact of his holiness in a profane and fallen world that does the work for him. If you've read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, there is in the book a description of Aslan, who is the Christ figure. And, and one character says, well, uh, is he safe? And the answer given is, uh, he's good. So he's not safe, right? He's very good. In, in fact, he's perfection. And because he's perfection, he's not safe for us at all, because we're not. That can be accomplished, as it turns out, as it did in Jesus' life, in a humble and loving and graceful and caring way, which isn't sloppy grace, everybody's in no matter what you think, say, or do. It's just accomplished by the invasion in the profane by the sacred. A, a line is drawn, and, and really your attitudes, my attitudes, their attitudes, determine which side of the line you might be on. The next part of the scripture says this, people went out to him, that's to John the Baptist from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan confessing their sins and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Whoever went out and listened to John likely went out and listened to John thinking that maybe he would be the, the precursor to a revolution and he was, just not the kind they were looking for. But when they were taken under the power of his preaching and, and heard some of the message he did a really good job of explaining this right look th this guy is, is the one who separates the wheat from the chaff there's a fire and some are going going to go into it because this guy is is the boss of that right so you need to get yourself together isn't that an interesting thought you need to get yourself together before you go meet jesus right before he arrives on the scene and before he starts teaching you god's truth and, and doing the things that he does you got to get yourself baptized and, and you got to come to grips with who you are and and what kind of nonsense has been going on in your heart and your soul and then you're ready to meet him we're not even talking about salvation we're talking about just meeting the holy one of god you, you got to kind of put on your spiritual best clothes that you can or, or that meeting is not going to go well and that idea is as repugnant today 
as it was in the time of John. We live in a, a time which so mirrors the time of Jesus that, that it saddens me, it saddens me to be a part of Christian leadership in this uh, era, but it saddens me because human beings are a hard lot, and it makes sense to me why it was so hard to set us free. We live in a, a time when Christians believe that because you go to church and because you sing the songs and you listen to the preacher, because maybe you do some outreach or whatever it is that, you're, that you think you're supposed to do, you are somehow separated, set aside, and better than the community around you who disavows the church or is angry at the church or wants nothing to do with it, right, that, that we're special. And not only that, but the truth is, in application, we tend to see our prejudice, our anger, our acting out against those who disagree with us as allowable and okay, after all. If you're chock full of truth, then the lie of the world offends you and you have a right to call them out and call them names and treat them badly. That's modern Christianity for the whole of my life. Christians walk around feeling pretty doggone good about their opinions and about their rightness and they feel pretty doggone angry at everybody who disagrees. It continues to be an offense to God for people who stand in need of saving to insist that the sin in their life that causes them to be in need is somehow of a higher grade than the sin of the commoner who is not a person of faith. And that always seems to be the status of religious folk, right? And I'm not harping on, on uh, this congregation or, or myself any more than anybody else. It just is. We naturally move into a, well, my sins are kind of excusable and, and their sins are not because I know Jesus. It doesn't work that way at all. In fact, the exact opposite is the way. If you know Jesus, the deal is you're not supposed to necessarily have less sins, but you're supposed to be working on them in, in a really diligent way so that the offense of your own sin genuinely causes you to seek repentance i'll remind all of us repentance does not mean blaming it on somebody else insisting that you're more right than other people it means doggone it take it seriously stop that nonsense turn around and walk the other way stop doing the things that lead to the sin christians should be noted not for their superior attitude but for their willingness to say i gotta take stock here right because it's not right with me I'm really mad at you, but the hatred that's inside, that's a problem i got to address. I have to find a way to be in disagreement without being so judgmental and angry. Let me give you a couple of examples. Some of you have heard them before. They grieve me because they were so very hard to wade through. When Corazon first came to us, and, and thank God that was a long time ago now, we had her preach in this service, and she speaks English pretty well. At that time, not as well as she does now, and not as clearly. So we had an interpreter. So Corazon would, would speak, and, and then the interpreter would read. If you don't know, we continue to do that at the later service. Uh, every time I preach, they use an interpreter, and, and people are just used to it. At that time, we weren't used to it. We did not do it well. The leadership team did not do it well, right? We, we didn't calculate well, if a sermon is preached and then it's preached again, it's gonna, if it's a 20-minute sermon, it's going to be a 40-minute sermon. Well, hers was a 30-minute sermon that made the service go way over. You want to see Methodists lose their religion? Right? We, we were like 25, 30 minutes over time in the service. Almost everybody, everybody that I could discern on, on that Sunday, leaned in and were so fascinated by Corazon's story and, and what she had to say, right, and, and how powerful she is, even though she's in that tiny little package, that they were willing to sacrifice being late to the restaurant and letting the Baptists win for a Sunday. They were gracious and kind to her. The next week, I got a phone call to go to lunch with a prominent person in the church. And so I went to lunch and was shocked by what happened at the lunch we ordered it was the vintage press by the way so it was a lovely lovely lunch we ordered the the food and then the person said if the mexican woman ever speaks again in that church i'll leave and if i leave all my friends go with me 
Let me repeat that to you in a different language. It offends me that you expected me to be a gracious uh, listener as somebody new talked to the church, and my time is so valuable that if you ever waste it again by making me be in worship too long, I'll quit. You know I am, my own self, always in repentance for the sharp edge that has been a part of my life. I had not repented for very long then. What I said as gracefully as I could is, doggone it, what do you think I'm going to say? What do you think I'm going to answer with that? You're talking to a Christian minister. What do you think my reply is going to be? Oh, great. Sure. Have your way. You just tell me how you want the place run, and that's what I'll do. You don't have to worry. You don't have to worry about going through withdrawal. I'll go and erase your name from the membership book today and take whoever you're going to take. But I'm not playing. It just broke my heart. It comes out even now sounding angry because it was just offensive. But it broke my heart because I knew the person who said those things was a, as good a person and as good a Christian as I have ever been. Really. I have my own problems too, right? His wrong does not make me superior. It makes me sad. Sad for him. Sad for us. Sad for Corazon. I did exactly what I said I would do. Let's imagine a scene. You're that individual, and you've done lots of good, lots of good. And it's Judgment Day, and Jesus asks you to explain yourself about that one incident. What are you going to say? Well, look, I had an appointment with important people after church. They don't have, right? Our, our deal was an hour. That's all the worship I could possibly stand for you, Lord. Can't you see how much more important I am than anybody else in the world? What are you going to say to Jesus about that kind of nonsense? How do you explain to the Lord of all creation who made all people, oh, no, no, I didn't have to be polite or, or graceful in that situation because it caused me to sacrifice a little bit. You can hear it, can't you? All of that sounds ridiculous if you picture it being said to Jesus to excuse that kind of behavior. Now, what do you think I'm going to say to Jesus when he says, are you kidding me, Creel? You couldn't hold your temper better than that? You made a scene in a restaurant? And then you went and, and broke the, the rules and took, the man, took his name off of the, the book? How could you be so judgmental? Because I was right. <laughs> I'll tell you my plan. It, it might inform you because I reckon that some of you are going to be in trouble on Judgment Day too. My plan is I, to tell the, the truth. I, I do not have an excuse. And after that, and after a couple other things that were really unpleasant, I tried, at least, to get my house in order, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I couldn't find a way to do the right thing in the right way. That's it. That's all I got. I might dance, and <laughs> but I am not going to stand and tell God who knows everything, oh, no, I was perfectly justified to be like that, because it's not true. John the Baptist said, there is trouble coming, right? And if you aren't right, if you aren't open, if you haven't repented, if you're not good with God, you're going to get singed. My contention is this. In the practice of modern Christianity, we would just do a lot better if more of us would, in fact, admit to ourselves that we are being singed. That no matter how right we are on any one subject, we have so much work to do to even prepare our hearts to be open to the power of God's forgiveness that it would occupy the rest of our lifetime and tend beyond that. You can have the right opinion, you can be right on an issue, but if you are not right in the way that you are right, it won't really matter. We're called to a very high standard because his winnowing fork is in his hand. And he knows the secrets of our hearts. One other quick story. There was a gentleman who ran a nonprofit, again, which did a lot of good. And I was informed, this is gossip, that he was sleeping with 
one of the office workers and with several of the people who came to that organization for help. And that's not good. So, again, this was before I had the stuffing completely kicked out of me. Uh, I went to see him. And I said, here's what I hear. And if it's true, you've got to stop that. That's not good, right? And he said, it's not a sin. I know, it was news to me too where you go, what church did you say you go to? I asked him, uh, you're married, right? Sleeping with somebody else, that's a sin. Let, let alone the ethical consequences of the rest of the nonsense we're talking about. And here's what he said with a straight face. I'm saved. I know. So I said, well, you're absolutely right. I apologize. I got to go. No, I didn't. What I told him was what you would tell him if you were big and dumb like me. If you're saved, I don't want to be. Right? How can being saved excuse that behavior? What's the matter with you? Come on. Again, the attitude thing is going to get me in a lot of trouble. Right? If you're in line behind me on Judgment Day and you giggle, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. What he was expressing was this. All my sins are removed because I, re- I confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And so whatever I do, it's done because I'm saved. I'm in. Once saved, always saved. If you're not a Methodist, right, and you're visiting or whatever today, that's not a Methodist theology. Methodists believe you can not only walk right out of your salvation, right, you can, you can intentionally throw it in the trash can. Once saved, always saved does not mean you can do any doggone thing you, you want to do. If you were really that saved, it would show in the way that you live in the opposite direction. So John the Baptist comes out and he's screaming and he's yelling and, and he's calling names, right? You brood of vipers. That, there's a popularity contest in preaching. And, and, and he tells them, you people are so, so horrible. You don't even get to see the Messiah until you get baptized and confess your sins, right? You've got to start at point one because you're not ready for this. And he was just telling the truth. It continues to be the truth. I'm saved. I confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior when I was a child, and I meant it. And I've held to that confession all of my life. But if I'm going to see Jesus this Christmas time, I know that the same thing that was true in the days of John the Baptist continues to be true. Wow, have I got some work to do. It isn't enough to hold right opinions. It isn't enough to know Scripture inside and out. It isn't enough to feel like you're superior to people who have other opinions or who live in a different way. None of that's really going to convince God of your righteousness. What convinces God of your righteousness is this. You look at yourself, not the other person. You stop thinking that what's wrong with you is the fault of somebody else because then you've made them God and they're in charge of you. And you just grow up a little bit in the spirit of the thing and recognize glorious it is to be saved and it is but the cost of being saved is like a mathematical equation and it tells us how serious repentance and confession continue to be the equation that we use is this that jesus had to suffer for our sins in our place now if he were suffering for my sins he would have had to watch TV with commercials. You know that's what the world thinks, isn't it? He might have had to go without an aperitif at dinner. But if he was suffering for your horrible sins, no wonder he had to bleed and die. The equation says, for your sins and mine, for ours, He was outcast and lost all of his friends. He was sold down the river by those who were his closest associates. He was brutally beaten, humiliated, spat upon, and then slowly and methodically destroyed by the power that was politics and Rome in his day. And he died between two undesirables. 
on any given day, if I'm telling the truth, I find it very hard to believe that he had to die that way for me. And then I start to think. And I know, yeah, yeah, doggone it. It isn't just for the sins of the people that I've talked about today. It's for mine. I've hurt a lot of people in my life. That temper, that sharp edge, that's a bad thing. And the fire it starts, hard to put out, very hard to put out. Because some of the people that I've harmed along the way with words, they forgive, but I know they carry it inside. Yeah. I'm incensed at other people's sins sometimes when I'm out of my mind. But I come back to myself pretty quickly if I stop and think about the price that was paid for my sins and why it had to be so hard. Because my sins have hurt other people and myself. And they needed that price paid. We as a congregation can be any way that we desire to be. I could start next Sunday telling you that because you're here and because we come from the tradition we come from and because we do church the way we do, we're better than everybody else. And doggone it, if the rest of the world were like us, it would be a super place. So go out and tell the losers to come in here and be winners. But I cannot find it in myself to do that. Or we could be grace-filled Christians who have the good sense to know, oh, the reason we do communion all the time is because I keep getting myself in trouble. And I need to repent one more time. That means to walk and live the other way. When Marilyn and I have a fight, if I'm the one who started it, and sometimes that happens. A part of what I have willed myself to do in our marriage, which results in a very, very healthy marriage, is not just to apologize, but to tell her, here's what happened, here's what I was thinking, here's how, what invaded my thoughts, here's what I was concentrating on, and because I love you, I am going to stop that process and go another way before it blows up again. Repentance is powerful because it takes you away from the end result, which is harm to another person. It is more than just saying, yeah, yeah, in a general way, I know I'm wrong. It is being serious. This thing that I did is a result of these things that I thought and that I allowed into my life, and I'm going to stop them now because I want to walk another way. We can be a congregation that in joy takes advantage of the opportunity to confess our sins, to reckon with what we are and what we have done, and to repent of them in so much as we know how to repent and walk a different way, and who then spreads the grace that invades our lives with people who, through their sinful actions, show us how horribly lost and afraid they are. That's the last part of the equation I'll talk about today because it, it maybe is the most important. I don't know what the rules are to go to heaven for sure, but I do know that it's more than saying an equation for other people to hear. And I do know that because this is my experience of Christianity. When I actually practice my faith in some humility and I try hard to reckon with my life in front of Christ. I am cleansed from the stuff that fills me up. It's taken away by the power of the Holy Spirit. And in its place, room is made for more grace and more genuine peace. And that results in the likelihood that I will grace more people than I will harm as I go forward. And that's such a beautiful hope to have carrying the regrets that I hope all of us carry about our lives, to stumble around and finally be filled with the hope that our lives might be a point of grace and an opening to someone else discovering the joy of serving Jesus Christ. That's better, way better. So Marilyn asked me this, this morning, um, how's, how's your sermon? And I said, I'm not sure they're going to like me when we're all done. But I, I know that isn't true. It's a hard thing. It's a hard thing to look at sweet Jesus, the giver of grace and the one who forgives us and all the rosy things that we say about him in the way that John the Baptist pointed out he was. But I promise you, it's going to be a whale of a lot harder 
if you miss who he is and what his presence in your life means and you don't take advantage of it, you lose now. And as the scripture says, there's a possibility you'll lose then. So friends, be serious today. Confess your sin. It's as simple as asking yourself, even if you were right, were you right in a way that hurt somebody else? And in confessing those sins, ask God to forgive you and then promise God that you're going to figure out what caused that and you're going to try to live a different way. When you do that, all of the glorious and majestic words that we use about Jesus become abundantly clear and true. I promise that is right. Let's bow our heads, shall we? Father, we give thanks to you for the gift of Jesus Christ, and we remember today the price that he paid for our salvation. Help us not to take it lightly. Help us to be serious about our confession and our repentance. Help us to honor you and to bring more grace and more holiness into this world. We thank you for forming us as a congregation, bringing us together this Sunday and all of the time, and we ask that you would bless the community in and through the grace that we manifest. It is in the beautiful and the sacred and the holy name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. The body of Christ broken for us. And the blood of Christ shed for us. So in the Methodist church, we practice open communion. You don't have to be a Methodist. You don't even have to particularly have any leaning in order to avail yourself of the means of grace, which are the elements of Holy Communion. Uh, we have them set out on the table, and, and um, with uh, COVID, we have the plastic cups. So, so take the plastic cups and uh, the bread back to your seat. Re, uh, dip the bread in the cup when you're ready. Receive it, and then be in an attitude of prayer uh, uh, again. Uh, confessing uh, and promising to repent and, and then receiving the forgiveness of Christ. Do that as your heart moves you and, and as you are ready and we'll be singing. Uh, you can join in the singing uh, when it seems right to you. So blessings to you and, and let's receive now. The sweetest that ever was heard Tell how the angels in chorus Sang as they welcomed his birth Glory to God in the highest Peace and good tidings on earth cross where they nailed him, writhing in anguish and pain. Tell of the grave where they laid him. Tell how he liveth again. Love in the story so tender, clearer than ever I see. Day. Let me weep while you whisper, love paid the ransom for me, love paid the ransom for me. Colossians 3 1 it says since you have been raised to new life with Christ set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the in the place of honor at God's right hand um, if if you would like to take communion with the pastor if, if you didn't have a chance to grab a piece he is right there. You can grab a piece of bread and dip it into the 
them to the juice. Or, or we, we had too little hope. <laughs>it's great to have had you in uh, worship with us today. Uh, don't forget tamales are on sale after uh, um, in the narthex. Be a great way to have a warm lunch. Also, the Christmas suite is next Friday at 5.30. Will you bow your heads now for a word of benediction? Father, so fill us with the Holy Spirit as we leave this place that others might see you at work in and through us. In Christ's name, amen.